All right, so now um, lecture five. Um, here we're going to dive into the um, lovely inorganic carbon uh, chemistry in seawater. Um, so we'll do a little bit of an overview um, to begin with, then we're going to get into the, the equations. So there's going to be some chemistry here, but I'm going to um, hopefully start from the very beginning. And, um, but please let me know if there's something that's not clear. I, sometimes um, I might get a bit sloppy with the notations or say the wrong thing, and it can get really, really confusing um, if you're not used to chemistry. So if it's not making any sense or there's like a symbol that you don't understand, please raise your hand and let me know, and I'll clarify that uh, as soon as I can. Um, I probably won't get through all this before morning tea, so we we'll, might just sort of stop in the middle when everyone's getting really hungry, but um, this is what's in this lecture. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually um, make these measurements for the inorganic carbon system, how we actually characterize it um, sort of in real life. And in the lab um, this afternoon, you'll see some real data, and we'll manipulate those data uh, and make plots of them so you'll get some more practice with that. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at, um, you know, what's actually quite interesting is how um, carbon speciation varies as a function of environmental variables like temperature and salinity in the ocean. And then, um, I'm, I'm sure we won't get to all of this before morning tea, but then we'll talk about the important processes that actually affect um, carbon in the oceans, such as um, respiration, gas exchange, carbonate precipitation, and so on. Um, so this is a <coughs> diagram of the global carbon um, cycle, I guess, uh, from the IPCC uh, report from last year. And um, this actually relates quite well to the whole biogeochemistry winter school in that um, tomorrow and uh, or th Thursday and Friday you'll hear um, from Peter quite a bit more about um, the carbon cycle on land and how this terrestrial um, processes affect uh, the, the atmospheric carbon dioxide. And then uh, today we're focusing on, um, today and yesterday, we're focusing on uh, the ocean. And so in this part of the lecture, I want to um, sort of relate what's happening in the ocean to the atmosphere. And of course, the atmosphere is, um, it's really annoying. <laughs> the atmosphere is really important because um, obviously it's the CO2 in the atmosphere that's affecting um, climate and that is being perturbed by anthropogenic perturbation. And, um, but all these fluxes into and out of the ocean and um, the land biosphere are really important in determining um, what's happening in the atmosphere. And um, we really need to understand what's going on in these reservoirs to predict how the atmospheric um, CO2 concentration is going to change um, into the future. Obviously, you also know in this graph, the, the red lines are the anthropogenic perturbation. So obviously, we need to know how these are going to change as well. But the natural processes are happening um, are continuing to happen and they might be affected by the changes in climate and we need to understand um, how that's going to play out. So one thing I want to draw your attention to here is just, um, so in, in these graphs, the, the arrows are representing fluxes between reservoirs. So in, um, I think these are units of petagrams of carbon per year. So that's <coughs> all the arrows. And then um, in the boxes, the boxes are the reservoirs of carbon and the numbers in the boxes are just the um, yeah, the amount of carbon. So the yeah, so the fluxes are in petagrams of carbon per year, and then the stocks or the amounts are the are in terms of petagrams of carbon. So you see, um, you can see that there's, for example, okay, 589. Um, that's the pre-anthropogenic petagrams of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, we can look at the vegetation. It's 450 to 650 petagrams of carbon in um, terrestrial vegetation. Um, about twice that, more than twice that, is actually in the soils. So the vegetation, the soil. So there's a lot of carbon in the terrestrial biosphere. If we go over here to the oceans, um, we see that this whopping huge number here, so 37,000 um, petagrams of carbon in the intermediate and <laughs> deep sea. So the ocean is really a massive reservoir of carbon. And that's really why it's so important in determining um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So because it's so enormous and because the fluxes um, between the, the, um, the ocean and the atmosphere are quite large, um, the ocean has just a really big impact on the atmospheric CO2 and it's able to change the atmospheric CO2 relatively rapidly. So it has a big, um, yeah, sort of a, can, can have a large impact on atmospheric CO2. Other things like um, there's obviously a lot of, um, uh, a lot of carbon in these geological reservoirs, 
generally in terms of natural variability, natural processes, they don't exchange very rapidly with um, the atmosphere. So we have um, volcanism and rock weathering are exchanging carbon between these um, sort of rock reser reservoirs in the atmosphere, but the fluxes between them are really tiny. On the other hand, the ocean reservoir is, is massive and it's exchanging carbon with the atmosphere very rapidly. So the ocean can have a big impact on the atmosphere and that's what we want to study today. Oh, so yeah, that's what I just said. So the ocean um, basically contains about 60 times more carbon than the atmosphere, so it can have this big leverage on what's happening in the atmosphere just because of its large um, size. And also the fact that it's um, exchanging really quickly with the atmosphere. by the way. <laughs> um, so some things you might want to ask is, you know, why does the ocean hold so much carbon? A, a lot of the most other gases in the combined ocean atmosphere system, the atmosphere is the reservoir of most of those gases, but the, the carbon is the opposite. The ocean is the reservoir of, of most of the carbon in those com the combined ocean atmosphere reservoir. So why is carbon so different? Um, you know, what are, what's the species? What form is the, car is the carbon in the ocean? What, is it possible for the ocean to hold more carbon? How much more carbon could it hold? Um, could it somehow give off some of the carbon that it's holding? Why might it do that? Um, and what happens to ocean chemistry as the ocean absorbs carbon from the atmosphere? What's going on there? So we'll try to answer some of these questions right now. <laughs> so if we look at the carbon in the ocean just in terms of its chemistry, um, so you might Think of um, carbon in the ocean, there's lots of organisms, they contain a lot of carbon, uh, all those phytoplankton Pete was talking about, the whales, fish, and so on. That's what we call organic carbon. And that's actually a minuscule amount of carbon in the ocean is in the organic form. So less than 1% of all the carbon that's in the ocean is actually organic. The vast majority of the carbon that's in the ocean of that 37,000 petagrams is what we call inorganic carbon. Um, yeah, so the organic carbon is all the organisms and stuff that you can see, and also their decayed remains. That's called dissolved organic carbon. All that stuff is tiny. The inorganic carbon are um, these, these are the main four species of, of inorganic, well, there's really three main species of inorganic carbon. And Pete mentioned this yesterday. Most of it is uh, what we call bicar bicarbonate, HCO3 minus. And then we have um, carbonate ion, <coughs> about 9% of it. And then there's a species called dissolved CO2, which is about 1% of it. And then there's a tiny amount of something called carbonic acid. So most of the carbon is inorganic and most of it is in this bicarbonate form. Um, so here I have some <coughs> pretty pictures of um, the inorganic carbon system, um, which we'll look in much more detail here. So here are the three species that I just mentioned, or the, the four, yeah, the carbonic acid, the bicarbonate, and the car carbonate ion. Um, we've got the, so, Basically, CO2 is a gas in the atmosphere, and it is um, exchanging with the surface layer of the ocean and dissolves into the surface ocean and forms what we call um, aqueous CO2. So that's dissolved CO2 in, in um, seawater. And it quickly um, dissociates into something called carbonic acid, uh, which then quickly dissociates into uh, bicarbonate and carbonate ion. Um, now this species here, the aqueous CO2, is really important in um, determining the flux of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. This is basically um, uh, CO2 gas that's in seawater, and we call that, we can, define, we can um, define its concentration in terms of a partial pressure of CO2. So that we call this PCO2, and this is a variable that's really important in defining the exchange of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. Because basically, if you have um, so the, the gradient between the PCO2 in the ocean and the PCO2 in the overlying atmosphere determines the flux of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. So if you're in a part of the ocean that has a very low, where the PCO2 of the surface waters is lower than the PCO2 of the atmosphere, that means the CO2 is going to want to go um, down the concentration gradient. It'll go from the atmosphere into the ocean. If you're in a part of the ocean where the PCO2 is, is higher, than the atmosphere. So the atmosphere piece, atmospheric PCO2 is about 400 parts per million, we said yesterday. So if you're in the part of the ocean where you know, there's upwelling or for whatever reason there's um, 500 parts per million CO2, which we ha actually have seen off the Oregon coast, just very high PCO2, that's going to 
generate a flux of CO2 from the ocean into the atmosphere. So it's just this um, um, <coughs> dissolved CO2 or PCO2 that's able to exchange with the atmosphere. All those other forms of CO2, they're, they're like dissolved in seawater. They can't actually, they're not gases, so they can't exchange with the atmosphere. So it's the PCO2 that's really important in determining the exchange of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. And all this chemistry that I was talking about determining the speciation of CO2, of carbon in the ocean, is basically reorganizing the carbon and making some of it PCO2 and some of it these other forms that actually can't exchange with the atmosphere. So it's really important to know um, how the speciation is affecting the PCO2 because that's the species that can exchange with the atmosphere. The other ones are like held in the water and they don't, they don't really interact with the atmosphere at all. Um, yeah, so the PCO2 is important for determining the air sea flux. Um, and this is a um, picture from the textbook just showing the distribution of surface waters of the, um, the gradient between the PCO2 and the ocean and the atmosphere, the surface ocean and the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere is pretty, I was talking to someone during the break, the atmosphere is pretty well mixed for most gases, so it basically has about the same PCO2 everywhere. So um, the flux between the ocean and the atmosphere is really determined by um, what the surface ocean PCO2 distribution looks like. So you can see that there's areas of the ocean where um, the, the difference is positive. So along the equator here, the equatorial Pacific, we have <coughs> positive values. Um, the, the ocean PCO2 is actually higher than the atmosphere PCO2. So here you're going to get a flux of CO2 into the atmosphere from the ocean. We have other areas where um, where the PCO2 um, atmosphere ocean difference is negative. So here we're going to get CO2 going from um, the atmosphere into the ocean. Um, now if you average all this out, and this is sort of a much more colorful depiction of that, and here we're actually showing um, the net flux, so not just the gradient, but the net flux <coughs> of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere, um, sort of averaged over many years and um, shown here in a color, color graph. So here, this is showing the grams of carbon um, per meter squared per year, the net flux uh, um, across the air, sea uh, the air sea interface. Now the flux is proportional to the, the gradient between the, um, the, the PCO2 in the water and the PCO2 in the atmosphere. That's the gradient I showed in the previous slide. Um, but it depends on more than just that concentration gradient. It actually depends on the wind. So the wind speed is going to um, the winds that kind of facilitate that transfer. So the faster the wind speed, the faster the exchange. So you can have, so the patterns that you see here reflect not just the, um, the gradient in PCO2, but also the, the windiness. So different parts of the ocean have different wind fields and um, that affects the, the rate of transfer of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. Here. Over here, you mean? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so Pete was talking about that yesterday. There's upwelling because of the, um, the divergence of the winds there. Um, you get a lot, oops, upwelling that's bringing deep ocean water up to the surface, and the deep ocean water has lots of carbon in it. And so that when it gets up to the surface, it um, brings all this CO2 up to the surface. So then you get a high gradient. The PCO2 in the surface waters there is actually higher than in the atmosphere because it's like deep water that's been brought to the surface. But on top of that, the biology there is limited by iron. So the biology is not drawing it down. So it's a combination of upwelling and iron limitation that causes this big source there. Um, now down, down along here in the, um, uh, near Tasmania, we see there's a big sink and that's um, due to a number of factors. One is just that there, we've got the, um, the westerly wind belt here blowing really strongly. So we have very strong winds that are facilitating the transfer here. Um, and you also have a combination of um, nutrient rich waters, kind of um, uh, cold nutrient rich waters moving up here. So you, and, and warming, so you get a big, um, it's kind of a, 
a bunch of different factors. Uh, there's a lot of biological drawdown, there's a lot of wind, and there's a temperature effect. So you get very strong drawdowns kind of in this band over here. We could spend the whole like three hours discussing this graph. I think we'll move on to, um, and you'll make some plots of this in the afternoon. So this afternoon we're going to look at um, sections in the North Pacific and a section in the, the North Atlantic. And we'll have a look at the, um, the PCO2 in the surface waters there. And you can decide whether or not there's sources or sinks um, to the atmosphere. Now, one, one thing I do want to point out here is if you look in the fine print here, so obviously this is averaged, um, this is an average. If we look over, um, if, you, if you added all these fluxes together um, and looked at sort of a global average PCO2 flux, you would get a positive number um, into the ocean. That's because, you know, because of anthropogenic increases in CO2, um, the oceans have taken up about a quarter of the CO2 that humans have emitted into the atmosphere. So on average, the flux of CO2 is going from the atmosphere into the ocean because the oceans are absorbing like a quarter of that anthropogenic CO2 every year. So the net flux, and that's why these, that's why there's so much interest in this is to try to actually quantify how much CO2 the oceans are taking up. So there's huge efforts internationally to actually map the surface ocean PCO2 to work out how much CO2 is going into the ocean. Um, yeah, so here, and they, here it's also important to look at um, climate conditions. So they've, they've um, referenced this graph to year 2000, which was non-El Nino conditions. During El Nino um, conditions, basically the upwelling along the equator shuts down and so you really get a much reduced flux of CO2 uh, from the ocean to the atmosphere. That makes a huge difference in calculating these um, these uptake maps. So, um, yeah. So this, in this particular case, they've got a net global air to sea flux of 1.42 petagrams of carbon per year, and that's a number that would feed into that first map, the first uh, picture that I showed you. Okay. So moving on from that, um, yeah. So the other species here that that are important are um, th these guys are really important: the carbonate and the bicarbonate together. Um, those two species together form something that we call alkalinity that I'll talk about more later. But basically it's the, um, the alkalinity is equal to the sum of these charges. So it's, you get a one for the bicarbonate and two for the carbonate because there's a minus two sign there. So that's the alkalinity. Um, more accurately, we can define what's called the total alkalinity, which just combine, accounts for these two guys and a bunch of other more minor constituents. But change the alkalinity by about 10%. You don't need to worry about that very much today. Um, and then if we, there's a couple of quantities that describe the whole system. So the pH of the seawater really depends on the entire um, <coughs> carbon speciation. So the whole, the pH is um, a consequence. It kind of comes out of the whole speciation. Another quantity that is really important is um, what we call the sum of the CO2 species. So if we add up all these CO2 species, that's called um, DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon. That's a quantity we'll see uh, over and over again today. So that's another way of describing the system. And um, these are, these here, the PCO2, the total alkalinity, the DIC, and the pH, those are all parameters that you can measure. You can't actually go out and measure like the bicarbonate ion, or you certainly couldn't measure the carbonate ion, the carbonic acid or the carbonate ion concentrations. Those are quite difficult to measure. But we can measure the PCO2, the alkalinity, the DIC, and the pH. And essentially, if you can measure any two of those parameters, then you can calculate the other two um, using the equations that I'm just about to show you in gory detail. Um, so that's an overview of <coughs> how it works. And um, the equations that I'm going to show you in a minute, um, they produce graphs that look like this. So this is a way that we can summarize the inorganic carbon speciation like in a in a um, body of seawater. So we're going to step through the equations. Um, and this is the graph that, that you end up um, being able to produce, is we can see, um, as a function of pH, we can see the relative proportions of the different carbon species. So, um, so here, look, this is just showing what I already showed before. So mm -hmm. pH of seawater today is about 8.1, this blue line. And uh, like I said before, most, well, you can see here that most of the carbon in seawater at pH 8 is bicarbonate, the red line. The next most abundant is the carbonate ion, that's the black line, and then the least abundant is the CO2. And now as the pH um, uh, changes, um, you would get changes in this 
speciation. So one thing you've probably heard about is ocean acidification. So that's um, the CO2 is gaining carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, and that actually shifts um, because the carbon is, is an acid. Well, I'll talk more about this later. But as the ocean takes up carbon, the um, inorganic carbon speciation shifts around. And essentially, the, you get a movement towards lower pH. And that changes the whole um, balance here. You get slightly more bicarbonate. You get m less carbonate ion, which is bad news for the corals. And you get more, um, um, more um, CO2. So this, yeah, the, these, this graph is just kind of an il illustration of the equations that we'll see in a minute. OK, so we're going to start with um, just a really, so we're not, we're not talking about carbon first. I just want to review some acid-base um, reactions, because it's basically what's happening when carbon dissolves in seawater. The carbon is, is, is an acid. And uh, if we start with the simple equations, it'll be a lot easier to move on to the, um, the actual equations. So just as a reminder, <laughs> um, so here we've got um, an acid, HBA. And um, it, this one is a weak acid, like carbon, um, a weak acid that doesn't completely dissociate in water. So some of, we've got a weak acid, and it dissociates into hydrogen ions and a weak base. And because it's a weak, because it's a weak base, sorry, it's, it's um, conjugate base. So because it's a weak acid, it's not completely dissociating. Some of, when you put it in water, some of it's going to stay as the acid, and then some of it's dissociating into its hydrogen and its conjugate base. And the um, relative amount of dissociation is described by this parameter here, K, which is the equilibrium constant. So that's telling you, you know, if you dump some of this stuff in water, how much is going to dissociate and how much is going to stay as the, as the acid. And K is just um, defined as the concentration of the hydrogen ion times the concentration of the base divided by the concentration of the acid at equilibrium. So that parameter just tells you how much it likes, that particular acid likes to dissociate in water. And that's like a known um, experimentally determined number. Um, so if we have, yeah, if we have, this is just what I showed before. So here's the K. And then another quantity that um, is important in describing the system is the total amount of um, the, the, the total amount of the base. So that's the base that's still attached to the hydrogen, and then the base that's just on its own. So that's like a total quantity. So if we just combine these two expressions here, and you might want to do this in your spare time, <laughs> um, you can get this equation down here, which is just, just it, these, sorry, these two equations here, which are describing how much um, of the acid and how much of the base you've got at equilibrium. So they, that just depends on the total, the total quantity here times the pH, and it depends on um, the equilibrium constant. So these equations just come straight out of these equations, and they kind of describe the system. They describe how much acid there is and how much base there is um, at equilibrium. And you can also express them in this sort of log notation here. Um, OK, so here's the same equations from the previous slide. I just wanted to remind you about what pH is. So pH um, is the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration. OK, and then we can make these plots. They're called Barum plots. And these are just like the ones that I showed, the, the first plot that I showed. Um, and this is really just comes out of these equations. So you can um, plug in the, the values. So say we had an equilibrium constant of 10 to the minus 6. And imagine our total concentration of, um, um, of the BA species is 10 to the minus 2. Um, then we can just plug in these values into these equations, and we can get these graphs that kind of describe the speciation of this really simple system. And that's just um, just to show you that in, in the MATLAB, this it really is just those equations plugging in these values, and we can make these graphs. So that's how those graphs are generated, just from those equations describing the acid-base chemistry. Um, OK, so here's the graph again. Now we can ask, well, what is the pH of this solution? We've taken some of this. Um, acid, we've put it in water and it's dissociated. What's the pH of the solution? Well, looking at this graph, it doesn't really tell us what the pH is. We've characterized the system because we've, uh, we've said what it's, um, what the total amount of, um, well, we know what its, what its equilibrium constant is and we know what the total um, acid concentration is. But if we want to actually know what the pH is, we need to introduce another constraint. And that's called the electroneutrality constraint. 
which is saying that the solution can't have a net negative or positive charge. It has to be electrically neutral. Um, so the sum of the positive charges uh, and the negative charges, um, basically the negative charges have to equal the positive charges. And in this really simple system, the only positive charges we have are the hydrogen ions, and the only negative charges we have are the, the, the bases. So um, we can define the pH using this constraint. So the pH is going to be um, determined where the, um, yeah, but using this constraint in this graph, <laughs> we can say that where the, um, the base concentration, so the blue line, is equal to the hydrogen ion concentration, which is the pH, the green line, that's the pH. So that electroneutrality is basically telling us, allowing us to tell what the pH of this solution is. So in this case, the pH is 4. So basically, once we know K, which is the equilibrium constant, we know the total amount of the um, acid in the system. We can basically completely characterize the chemistry of the system, and we can know its pH, and we know how much of the different species there are. So that's basically what we do with um, the carbon system in seawater. Does anyone have any questions about that? <laughs> Perfectly clear? Oh, no. um, just want to see a couple more things about this plot here. Um, so, uh, so we're, I was talking about K, which is the equilibrium constant. We can also define PK, which is just the negative logarithm of K, kind of like pH. Um, and when you look at these plots, when you have the pH being equal to the, the PK value, um, so uh, here, so the PK of the system is 6. So when the pH is equal to 6, that means that the, that's, at that point, the concentration of the acid and the base species are equal. So you see the, the blue line and the red line are crossing here. Um, then when you have a pHs that are less than the pK, so over here in this area, then the acid species dominates. And when you have pHs that are greater than the pK, then the base species dominates. So these plots are kind of useful for, um, that, that lets you tell just by knowing what the equilibrium constant is. It's kind of a way of, uh, being a, and if you know what the pH is, it gives you some idea of a feeling for what the speciation is going to be like without doing the calculations. Okay, and this is just a summary of everything I just said. Um, I know it looks quite scary, but I just want to walk you through it. And here we're just including water for completeness, but you can kind of ignore water if it's too scary. Um, so <laughs> we have our reactions over here. This is the one I talked about before, and here's the same one for water. And here we have the equilibria which is what I said before, and here's what it looks like for water. And then we have the equations derived from over here, which just describe um, the relative amounts of the different species, which is, again, what I had before. And then the, we have the conservation um, statement, which is telling us um, that everything has to add up, like we have to account for all the different species. Um, and then we have our electroneutrality, which is really important in determining the pH. Now, I just want to show you this so you can see how the, um, the more complicated um, um, software that we're going to look at this afternoon, how it's actually working. So this gives you a good idea. So here we have the electroneutrality statement, which is what I showed before. And here, uh, this is what I showed before, that the, sta uh, the uh, expressions for hydrogen ions, so that's what we're going to use to calculate the pH. So this is the simple case, ignoring water. So if we take this equation here and just rearrange it, so we have um, all these guys on one side and zero, oops, zero on the other side. You get this, this expression here. Now this expression, you might want to do this again in your spare time just to convince yourselves. But see this expression here, we can actually calculate the pH, so the hydrogen ion um, concentration. We can just calculate it from this equation if we um, kind of find the roots of this quadra quadratic equation. So that's how we would find the pH of a solution if we were ignoring the water, this is a very simple case. This is how we would actually calculate the pH. And, or we could do it graphically like this, or we could do it mathematically like this. Now, once we add in water, it gets a little bit more complicated. The, the equation actually um, has hydrogens on both sides, and it gets more complicated. And there's not a simple solution here, so you actually have to solve it by iteration, um, like making an initial guess and kind of um, uh, recalculating the, the hydrogen ion concentration until you come to a, a stable solution. So that's why it's, that's why calculating the pH of seawater is not so simple. You can't just sort of type it into your, um, it's not a simple formula that you can derive quite easily. 
And that's why we'll see this afternoon when, for example, we'll use this program called CO2-SYS that does this iteration for you, so it makes the calculations much easier. But if you were um, stranded on a desert island, <laughs> for example, and you didn't have CO2-SYS and you really had to calculate the speciation of seawater, um, you could use these equations and um, do it by hand. Um, and you'll also see when we look at the box model, the box model that we're going to look at um, has kind of a, it's in Excel and it has sort of a primitive version of um, CO2 cis in it. So it's actually calculating the full speciation of seawater in it. And, and you'll, you'll see that when you, there's a macro in there that you have to run and it does this iteration for you. So that's why it's doing an, sort of an iteration is because you end up with um, a problem like this where you have to solve the equation by um, iteration. So I just wanted to, sh hopefully you'll never be stranded on a desert island and have to do this by hand, but um, if you ever are, this is what you need to do. Um, okay, so that, that was our very simple case. I'm not going to go through all of that for seawater, but basically it's the same thing in seawater. When carbon dissolves in seawater, it's pretty much the same as that simple case, except it's more complicated because the carbon is not, it's, it's um, doing sort of a two-step um, dissociation. So first it, first it, um, the CO2 in the atmosphere is um, equilibrating with the, sea, with the surface water. So it's this gas exchange between the atmosphere and the surface layer of the ocean. That's called, you might have heard of Henry's Law. It describes the partitioning of a gas between the air and the water. So that has its equilibrium constant. And then the CO2 um, what, that's in the water dissociates twice more. So now we have two, two more Ks. It's getting much more complicated. So first it dissociates into bicarbonate. It's got this K1, and then there's another dissociation uh, into the carbonate ion, and that's K2. But it's basically the same as what I showed before, that it's just this acid, but now it's dissociating twice. So we've got a K1 and a K2. And the K1, it's exactly the same. The K1 is just the, um, the ratio of uh, the stuff on the right-hand side divided by the stuff on the left-hand side, ignoring water. And the K2 is, again, over here, the stuff on the right-hand side divided by the bicarbonate on the left-hand side. So we have two equi equilibrium um, equations here. And then we have our um, total expressions. So we have the mass balance for carbon. So the carbon, this is the DIC, the dissolved inorganic carbon. It's just the total amount of the carbon-containing species, the CO2 plus the bicarbonate, the carbonate ion. That was the same as our um, BAT in the previous example. It's just saying that we have to account for all the carbons that are in the water. Um, and then in the previous example, we talked about electroneutrality, that the pluses had equal to minuses. When we're talking about carbon in seawater, um, that charge balance is expressed by um, this quantity that we call alkalinity. So it's a little, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but the, uh, the alkalinity is kind of our other um, way of characterizing the system. It's analogous to the charge balance um, in the previous example, but here we Again, it's more complicated because it's carbon, but um, that, that, that's called alkalinity, and it's basically the sum of um, the charges in this carbonate system. So if we, um, if you, again, you can feel free to do this in your spare time, but if you take these equations and rearrange them, yeah. Oh, here, that's because the alkalinity is, um, I'll, sh I'll show it later, but it's basically because there's a two here. It has the carbonate on it has a negative two charge, and this is relating to the charge balance. So because it's got a negative two charge, it kind of counts twice, whereas the bicarbonate just has a single negative charge, so it just counts once. Uh, oh, here. Um, no, I, I think that's right. 
Oh, yeah, no, sorry, you're right. Yeah, sorry, yeah, it should just be a plus. Yes, sorry, no, no. There, there should be a two here and a plus there. Yes. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, no, the hydrogen just has one, <laughs> one plus. Um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so if you take those equations and um, go th rearrange them, you can express the, the carbon species just like we did in a previous example, you can express the carbon species as a function of the DIC, the various equilibrium constants, and the, the hydrogen concentration. And then you can plug those all in and make graphs like we did before, uh, but now here for the carbon speciation, and um, this is what it looks like. And so here, um, because we've got two dissociations and two equilibrium constants, you, you get two PKs, so it looks a little bit uh, more it's more, um, looks different than the previous example because there's the two dissociations, but essentially it's the same thing. We have, um, so here's the, the pH, that's the, the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion. This is on a log scale. And then we have the, um, the carbonate ion dominating at low pHs, uh, sorry, at high pH. And we have the bicarbonate um, ion over here, um, the carbonic uh, acid at the really low pHs. And This is basically the same as, uh, yeah, th th that's, you can think of, sorry, you can think of the carb carbonic acid as um, CO2. They exchange really rapidly. So that's why this is different than the previous graph. Um, okay, so we get these three equilibrium constants that describe the reactions. Now these constants, um, they're determined experimentally and they depend on temperature and salinity and pressure. So in the real ocean, um, you know, if you actually wanted to calculate this, you need to know the temperature and the pressure and the salinity of each one of your samples. And then these um, equilibrium constants are going to be slightly different depending on those conditions. So that's why it gets very um, nice to actually have a computer program do this for you because otherwise you have to basically look up different constants for every sample that you've got and it can become quite a pain. So the, um, the program that we'll be using this afternoon will make it a lot easier. You basically just tell it um, what the temperature and salinity and pressure is of each of your samples, and it'll go and look up the right. There's essentially um, equations relating how these parameters vary with um, temperature and salinity and pressure, and the program just has those equations in them and looks up, gets the right number. Um, so, yeah, so we're just coming back to here. So here we've got our four equations, the two equilibria, and then the mass balance, and the, um, the alkalinity, which tells us about the, the charge balance. And we have six variables that we're interested in uh, in describing the system, the PCO2, the bicarbonate, the carbonate, the pH, the DIC, and the alkalinity. So we have four equations and um, sort of six unknowns. So we have basically two degrees of freedom, which means we just need to measure two of these quantities, and then we can use the equations to calculate the rest of the system. So that, that's what we do in practice. Um, so here's the, the four equations. And then here's the four things that we can measure. So basically, we, we take two of these variables, and then we um, uh, then we yeah we measure two of these variables, and then we can use them in these equations to completely characterize the inorganic carbon system in seawater. Um, and and these things can all be measured at sea, so we can um, and in the lab. And they can be measured with, um, these are some estimates of sort of the accuracy that you can measure these different parameters with. And in the lab this afternoon, we'll see some um, data where they've measured um, the alkalinity. The alkalinity and DIC are, are um, used a lot in models and use a lot in measurements because they, they don't depend on um, temperature and salinity, so they're sort of conservative quantities. Um, so in the lab this afternoon, we'll see some data where they measured alkalinity and DIC, and then we'll plug those into the um, the calculator and it'll generate the, um, the PCO2 and the pH for us and we'll be able to look at their distributions uh, with depth. Um, yes, that's what I said before. So yeah, DIC and alkalinity, the, um, modelers really like to use them because like I said, they're conservative. So they don't, um, they're, they're kind of total quantities. They don't change with temperature and pressure and salinity. Um, but really you could use any of these quantities or maybe you could measure three or four of them and then check internal consistency. Um, but the minimum that you need is two of these quantities and then you can calculate the um, speciation using the equations. 
Um, Okay, so for example, so let's say we um, took some seawater and we measured um, the DIC concentration of um, 2100 micromoles per kilogram and um, say we measured the pH was 8.1. So we took our seawater and we, um, we actually measured DIC by adding acid to the sample and then measuring how much CO, the total amount of CO2 that's been um, uh, come off from that sample. So that's the total inorganic carbon. And you measure pH by um, using spectra, um, measuring dyes. So dyes, you add some dye to the seawater that um, turns more or less, um, that creates color that's proportional to the amount to the hydrogen ion concentration. So say we've measured those, and we could now when we're on a desert island, we could actually, if, since we've measured the pH, it's a lot easier. We could actually do this um, quite easily. Just take our equations, plug in um, the equilibrium constants for the temperature and salinity conditions that we've got. And then we can calculate the um, speciation of our sample. So if we do this with these conditions, we come up with um, uh, 104 micromoles per kilogram of CO2, uh, 1800 uh, bicarbonate, and 272 carbonate ions. So it's just like we saw before. The bicarbonate is the dominant one, the carbonate ion is the second most abundant, and then the CO2 is the least abundant. So that's just coming straight out of these, um, these equations. Okay, so finally, on to a bit of the alkalinity. Um, I know you're all dying to know more about alkalinity. So I said it was um, the charge balance for seawater, and this gets to the question that Pierce was asking. So we need the charge balance to kind of characterize the system, and it's an important constraint that allows us to kind of um, uh, define the speciation of that parcel of seawater. Um, so, so basically, if you take all the major salts in seawater, all the, the, the cations like that I showed in the first lecture, the positively charged guys. Uh, if you add up all the number of positive charges, so for each, for sodium, so here's it's the concentration of, of each one of these guys uh, in millimoles, 468, uh, 53.2. So for each one of here, we're going to um, basically keep, keep track of the number of charges. So sodium has just a uh, plus one. So its charge equivalence is, four, is the same as its concentration, 468. Magnesium has a two plus charge, so it gets um, double the, um, the, the, the charge, uh, the amount of positive charge is double its concentration because there's a little two here. So 106.4. The calcium as well gets double, uh, potassium and so on. So if you add those all up, we get 605.38 positive charges. You can do the same for these um, negative, uh, negatively charged ions over here. Um, so yeah, this guy gets double, single, and so on. If we add these up, we get 603.24. Now, um, just like our solution can't have net positive or negative charge, it's the same for seawater. It can't have a net negative or positive charge. It's basically electrically neutral. But if you see here, there's um, an imbalance. We have more positive charge than negative charge. And that difference between the, the positive charges and the negative charges, um, in this case, 2,140 uh, 2, micromolar, that's exactly balanced by um, the, car the alkalinity. So <laughs> this is um, compensated for by the carbonate system. And that's basically another definition of alkalinity. So these guys here, these, these weak acids that can kind of change their dissociation, that they kind of uh, reorganize themselves so that they um, exactly balance this charge imbalance. So all these um, weak acids of the um, carbonate system, plus some other ones that we're less interested in, they, um, they're, yeah, they reorganize themselves so the alkalinity is exactly equal to this imbalance in the, um, the major ions. So that's one way of thinking of the alkalinity is just the charge imbalance between um, the species that can't, um, the strong acids and bases, basically. The no, no, it doesn't actually, uh, it is recording, but it just records what's on the screen uh, and, okay. and our voices. So it doesn't actually show us at all.
<laughs> I don't know why it keeps moving around like that. It's, it's quite a nice room, actually. To be fair, I'm to get to have a great station. Yeah, so that would be good. Oh, really. It's actually really a negotiation room. You can move, like, you can bring a table over here if you want some people oh, yeah, at the front. I need, I need sort of, I need to find people in that niche. Yeah, um, so we can move one of the one tables from the other room in here. And you can have different stuff on the two different screens if that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. So no, it should work well. Yeah. <laughs> or at least we won't. Bring it in. <coughs> If I tilt into here, oh yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. I um I asked everyone yesterday uh, to be able to decide on a base year for the negotiations, and so I'm going to to make this relatively easy. I'd like to show of hands who would like um, 1990 as your base year. <laughs> Okay, that's a huge response. <laughs> uh, show of hands for 2000. And a show of hands for 2010. <laughs> so I, I declare that our base year is 2000. Um, okay, so, yeah, so I just went through all the equations and then um, these are some packages you can use and this afternoon we'll use this one called CO2-SIS and we'll use it in MATLAB, but it's available in um, Excel if you prefer. Um, so I just want to show you some examples, actually you'll be making plots just like this <laughs> this afternoon, um, but I just wanted to show you, if you take like a... Um, <coughs> package of seawater and um, vary some of the parameters. So I just want to have a look at how that's going to affect the speciation of seawater. So we're not looking at any sort of processes here. We're just looking at how the speciation will change in a closed system, um, just based on the equations that I showed you. So say we take some seawater and um, that has these um, characteristics, so, uh, this uh, 2300 alkalinity, uh, 2100 GIC, and a salinity of 35. And we just um, change its temperature. Um, you get a uh, relationship like this, where the PCO2 um, increases quite strongly as you increase the temperature from, say, 0 to 30 degrees. You can get changes of PCO2 that cover um, a very large range. Remember, the PCO2 today in the atmosphere is about 400. So we can see there's quite a strong sensitivity of uh, PCO2 to temperature. Obviously, that's quite a large range of temperature. Um, we can also look at the sensitivity, sensitivity to salinity. Um, here, this is the, um, the most ocean salinity is um, very tightly in this range here, around 34 to 35. Um, but if we look at a, a full range of salinity from like the freshest surface waters to um, say the, the Red Sea, we see that the um, PCO2 is actually not that sensitive to salinity, especially when we consider that most ocean salinity is really just covering this, this small range here. So, pretty small sensitivity to um, salinity compared to temperature. 
Um, here's one where we're going to take that um, CO2, uh, take the um, unit of seawater, and let's just change um, the DIC concentration. So this would be like um, the ocean absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. We're just going to increase the total amount of carbon in that <coughs> unit of seawater. And as you do that, the PCO2 goes up. Um, so that's like the ocean absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. The ocean PCO2 then will increase. And um, the, the pH decreases. So this is uh, like ocean acidification as the ocean is absorbing more CO2 from the atmosphere. DIC goes up, pH goes down, and the PCO2 goes up. Um, then we can also look at what happens if we vary alkalinity. Now in the ocean, as I'll show later, alkalinity, the total alkalinity of the ocean um, uh, can vary depending on um, the removal of alkalinity by um, carbonate precipitation. So as organisms precipitate calcium carbonate, they, um, and they sink out and you know, rain to the seafloor, that's removing alkalinity from the ocean. Um, another, the alkalinity in the ocean also depends on the balance of, basically like, like I showed in the first lecture, it's like the balance from rivers and um, the balance between what's coming in from rivers. The rivers are delivering bicarbonate and carbonate and what's um, being removed through um, sedimentation of these uh, <coughs> calcium carbonate organisms. So uh, from place to place in the ocean, you can get variations in the alkalinity depending on um, the balance of precipitation and evaporation. So when you get a lot of fresh water, we'll see this in the lab as well, um, like in an estuary, if you have a lot of fresh water, you can get um, low salinity and basically low alkalinity. So that's one way that you might actually have variations in alkalinity kind of from place to place in the modern ocean. And over longer time scales, the alkalinity balance of the ocean kind of depends on the um, relative amounts coming in from rivers and leaving through um, uh, sedimentation of calcium carbonate organisms. So anyway, <laughs> we'll revisit that later. But so we can look at the way alkalinity affects um, the carbonate system. So here's um, the PCO2 as the function of alkalinity. And um, I showed this before in, in a, the equation, but you can see that as you um, increase alkalinity, the PCO2 actually decreases. Uh, as you decrease alkalinity, uh, PCO2 increases. So this is quite um, important over long time scales and um, it's something that uh, we don't often think about. So as you get more um, alkalinity, basically the, um, there's more species in the seawater that can kind of hold on. They, we say they scavenge the, um, the PCO2. So like the carbonate and the um, bicarbonate are kind of holding on to the carbon and preventing it from being um, PCO2. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's holding those carbon species in a form that's not um, a gas and, and it's preventing it then from exchanging with the atmosphere. So changes in alkalinity can affect um, the PCO2 as well. And we'll see that um, in the lab when we manipulate um, some of the processes that affect alkalinity in the oceans. So here's um, just some distributions of what these species actually look like in, yep. Is there, you know how you sort of talk about like the scenario about like how the process is going to be the alkalinity of the acid, like is there any approximations you use to calculate the PCO2's different future temperature for these systems? Uh, yes. Um, for temperature, there's there's um, there's been um, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but uh, I think yeah, there th it's been determined experimentally. There's a paper by Takahashi where they actually just experimentally determine that, um, and so that's a widely used number. It's in the Sarmiento textbook. Um, yeah, it's just a um, exponential relationship. It's, yeah. Um, in, uh, yeah, so the, the, this is what it, these species actually look like in the ocean. In the lab, you'll actually be looking at this, this very section here in the Pacific, but we're only going to be looking at the, the northern sec, um, part of it. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll explore this a lot more in, in the lab. But um, in this case, the, um, they've measured the, the total carbon, that, that's the DIC. Sorry, there's different terms being used here, but this is the DIC, the total inorganic carbon, or dissolved inorganic carbon, and here's the alkalinity. So th these two parameters have been measured, and then they've derived all these other ones um, using the equations. Um, so we can see, um, yeah, that the total carbon tends to be higher in deeper waters and low in the surface waters, 
use this biological pump. Um, and the alkalinity also has a gradient, but it's not quite as strong. Bicarbonate shows kind of the same distribution. The CO2 has pretty much the same sort of pattern. And we see the um, carbonate ion is like the opposite. So the carbonate ion um, is basically the inverse of um, the, the DIC. It has higher concentrations in surface waters and lower concentrations in um, deep waters. And that's a consequence of basically the, the inorganic carbon speciation and those reactions. And um, I guess you can go back and if you go and have a look at the um, approximations that I showed you, you'll just sort of see how this all works out. But this um, lower carbonate ion concentrations in deep waters is an important factor of ocean chemistry. And it is basically the reason why um, if you look at marine sediments, um, if you look at marine sediments, you'll see um, there's kind of like a, a snow line. <laughs> so if you had a, a seamount that's sitting up um, above the topography, kind of shallow depths, the seamounts will often be covered in um, calcium carbonate. So it kind of look like snow, whereas the deeper plains will be barren of calcium carbonate. That's because as um, calcium carbonate falls through seawater, it gets into lower and lo lower concentrations of carbonate ion. And um, those waters, we say they become more and more corrosive to the calcium carbonate. The, it's the solid calcium carbonate is going to then want to dissolve in these really carbonate poor deep waters. Um, so as you get into deeper and deeper waters, there's less and less carbonate ion and the calcium carbonate um, just dissolves away. So the only place where you see calcium carbonate preserved in sediments is kind of on these mountain tops <laughs> um, that are sticking up from the topography. Um, okay, so this, so we've just been talking about the, um, the speciation in kind of a, a closed bottle. Now we're going to go back to the ocean and see how this plays out, uh, some of the processes that actually affect um, these, these um, quantities in the ocean. So this is a graph that you see quite often um, showing DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon, and total alkalinity. And um, the lines here are, um, the dashed lines are contours of pH, and then these solid lines are contours of CO2. Um, and then the, these arrows are showing the effect of different processes on these distributions. So it's kind of like a four-dimensional <laughs> plot with a lot of information on it. We'll kind of step through it here. So the first thing is the release and invasion of CO2. So CO2 going from the atmosphere into the ocean, and then um, that would be CO2 invasion, and then CO2 release is when the CO2 is going from the ocean to the atmosphere. Um, so invasion of CO2 um, causes DIC to increase, and release of CO2 to the atmosphere causes DIC to decrease. has absolutely no effect on the alkalinity. Um, photosynthesis and respiration, which we talked about yesterday, um, photosynthesis um, sucks up CO2, so it decreases DIC, and respiration releases CO2, so it increases DIC. Um, it also has a small impact on the alkalinity, and that's mostly because um, photosynthesis also uses um, nitrate, which is a negatively charged ion, so that um, um, uh, decreases the nitrate concentration and, and increases that um, charge imbalance, so you get a a uh, slight increase in alkalinity. Um, this red line is showing um, uh, calcification and dissolution of calcium carbonate. So um, I realize I don't think I actually said this anywhere, but calcium carbonate is, um, is a solid. So that's what uh, like shells of a lot of organisms are made of, this solid calcium carbonate. and um, And it's um, basically formed from calcium ions uh, and carbonate ions. So when you um, precipitate calcium carbonate, um, you uh, remove um, um, carbonate ions. And you remove, that, that's a big, uh, has a large impact on alkalinity. It removes the alkalinity. Um, when you dissolve calcium carbonate, you're releasing those carbonate ions back into solution, and the, the calcium ions as well, and that's increasing the alkalinity. Um, now, calcium carbonate also contains <laughs> carbon, so it's also um, changing the DIC. So as you form calcium carbonate, you're removing um, one carbon, so it's changing the DIC by one unit, but you're um, taking out two charges here, the C 
got these. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, you're <coughs> changing the alkalinity by two units. Two is here. Um, so it changes the alkalinity by two, two units and the DIC by one unit. So those are the main processes that affect um, um, the carbon system in seawater. So in, um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate. So this, the photosynthesis is only happening in, in the surface waters. And then the respiration, uh, um, well, the respiration happens in surface waters as well, but the, it's dominant in the deep, dark waters where there's no um, photosynthesis occurring. Um, calcium, uh, calcification is mostly happening in the sunlit surface waters because it's the organisms that are doing that, like um, coccolithophores that Pete mentioned yesterday. And then the dissolution is happening uh, predominantly at depth. So um, we'll come back to this in the lab, but basically that's why um, these processes together are what generate these um, distributions in the ocean. Um, and this is just a summary of, um, of all that. So just to summarize um, this bit of the lecture, so, we s so I said at the beginning that the ocean contains 60 times more carbon than the atmosphere. And um, really the reason for that is that CO2 is reacting with seawater. It's not just dissolving into seawater. Through these dissociation reactions, it's actually reacting with the seawater. And for that reason, um, the ocean can basically hold a lot of CO2. It has a big reservoir of CO2. Um, then we can represent the inorganic carbon system in seawater um, by the set of equilibrium acid-base reactions um, uh, together with um, a mass balance for the carbon that's defined by the DIC and then a charge balance, which is defined by the alkalinity. And together, these um, four equations determine um, the pH of the seawater and the relative abundance of the different species of carbon in seawater. Now, of the species, this gaseous CO2, or the PCO2, that's the one that's really the key for understanding whether the ocean is a source or a sink of CO2 to the atmosphere. And um, we talked about the effects, the things that impact PCO2. Um, so it increases with increasing temperature and it decreases with increasing alkalinity. Um, and yeah, if we know any two of the DIC alkalinity, pH and PCO2 through measurements, then we can completely characterize the inorganic carbon system. And we normally do that with software packages like CO2-SYS that we'll see this afternoon. And then the processes that are important are the uh, invasion and evasion of CO2 through gas exchange across the interface, and then the production and remineralization of organic matter and the precipitation and dissolution of um, calcium carbonate. 